Today, Killick Rugby is speaking to Damien Hopley. Damien is a former England and Wasp centre and the founder of the Rugby Players Association. You mentioned concussions there, probably the single highest match injury um, out there today. How big an issue is it? We, we brought a chap called Chris Nowinski over from um, the Institute in America, and he was a former uh, NFL player and WWE wrestler. And he was really talking about concussions, sub-concussive episodes. And I think at that point, we didn't quite fathom quite what a big issue this was. Because I think a lot of players in the room probably felt they hadn't been concussed. And then when we walked through symptoms and, um, and the like, a lot of players went, no, actually, that has happened to me. And, and as we've become more aware of the concussion issues, it's now the number one injury in, in rugby, uh, defined by the audit that we've been running for the last 12, 13 years with the rugby union and the premiership clubs. Um, I think a lot of it now is around awareness and actually players realising that yeah, they are getting sub-concussive episodes um, and actually not rushing back to play, trying to change the culture now of actually a player not being put straight back on the field. We obviously saw the George North incident and most recently the Mike Brown incident at Twickenham. I think the important thing is concussion is not an injury that you can see. So the most important thing is the players are protected from themselves and the right medical advice is given. And I'm sure it's incredibly frustrating, as Mike Brown talked about at the weekend, not being allowed to go back on. But in the long term interest of that player and the game as a whole, it's important that we uh, detect, recognise, remove those players, uh, take them for their head injury assessment. And then if they're not fit to carry on, then the doctor makes the call. So players can be their own worst enemy at times. And oh, absolutely. Play on regardless. I think it's like any scenario where if you've got competition from uh, club level or national level, you're always very concerned that if you give your um, your competition a chance or a sniff, you know, he may well play extremely well and take your place. I think a lot of players can typically be quite selfish around trying to ensure that they are you know, um, giving the best account of themselves and they might not always be the best pos- in the best position to, to make that decision. Can anything be done to, to, to prevent concussions happening or is really tackling this issue, dealing with them once they have happened? I think that the challenge, you know, if you're going to look probably more globally is do we need to look at law changes? Do we need to look at use of substitutions? I think that there's probably a think tank that needs to sit down and, and actually try and uh, come to terms with it. Not least if we look at across the the Atlantic to the NFL and the billion dollar um, settlement that's just been reached with a number of former players in the NFL. There's a huge litigious issue around this and clearly as the players representatives we want to make sure that our players are getting the best protection. So I think that's probably the the most important thing is that we are seen to be doing everything we possibly can to educate um, but also do we need to look at how the game is played. I know some people have talked about you know taking two players off making the pitch wider I think we need to look at all of these things to try and understand and give the players the best possible opportunity. Um, but it is a collision-based sport, as I'm widely quoted saying, and, and these things happen. I think what's important is when things go wrong and players get concussed, they get the best possible treatment, as we saw on Saturday at Twickenham. Do you think if the, the nature of the game doesn't change, you'll see mums and dads discouraging their children from taking the sport up, um, and, and, and I suppose rugby falling by the wayside as a sport because the injuries are so severe these days. I think it's really interesting when you look at, um, for me, like the societal impact of rugby. I think the values that rugby instills in you as a, as a young person and certainly what the sport has given me would far outweigh, I think, the areas around sort of concussion and what we've seen. But clearly the images like we saw in Cardiff with George, like we saw at Twickenham with Mike, aren't, aren't great. It's I guess it's how we best, as I said, look after the players, but also... I think you know, you've know you got two quite different games now. You have the amateur game uh, and the professional game. And uh, the concern is that we start seeing the tackles flying in at amateur level as they are at professional level. So that's why I just think we need to be a bit more joined up in terms of our thinking, probably demark the two sports and say, well, for example, in, in America, not many people play American football apart from the NCAA collegiate system and the NFL. Um, we'd hope that participation in rugby would continue to grow. And also with the Home World Cup this year, we're hugely excited about what that can do for the game. We think it's going to be an absolute game changer. What's important is we don't focus, clearly we we want to put as much store into the concussion protocols as possible, but I think there's an awful lot more to rugby than what we're seeing in in what I would call the sort of the bad headline category at the moment. When you started the RPA in 1998, there was a set of conditions you found in front of you. How have the issues changed for today? 
They haven't changed greatly, actually. I mean, I found a, a piece I did recently talking about number of games in the season, and I still think there's too much rugby being played. I think, you know, we talked about the Lions in 2013, and there were three Leicester players, Tom Youngs, Jeff Parling, and Dan Cole, who were involved that season, including the Lions tour, involved in over 38 games. So they weren't actually playing that number of minutes, but they were involved, so they were doing all the training, all the preparation. And for me, 30 is about the right... I'm no doctor, clearly, um, but it's about the right sort of number. And, and I just think sometimes we are so much of our top players and then we wonder why they break down. We have a, a, an absolutely binding agreement in England that there will be no midweek rugby uh, in the Premiership. I think we all recognise the players need to recover. You then look at the Lions, which is a wonderful institution, but probably something of an anomaly in the, in the modern sporting environment. Dan Cole played in or was involved in 10 of the 12 games on the Lions tour. So I think sometimes we talk about player welfare. I'm not quite sure it's actually as high up the, the priority list as some would have us believe. So I think that it is around, certainly around that, um, uh, that sort of the rest periods, how we look after our players better. Um, and I don't think that will ever go away, to be perfectly honest. But it's interesting in, in America, and I, I refer a lot to NFL because I think that the comparisons are there for all to see, but they have a limit of one contact session per week uh, in the regular season. They obviously play a 16-week regular season. Clearly they play in stadia that are five, six, seven times bigger than where we're at. But in terms of the, uh, the volume of sport that's played, it's just much smaller and the welfare, therefore, we believe is far greater. And everything is absolutely contracted, as you'd imagine, in that sort of US environment. You know, you can't wear a grey T-shirt on a Thursday. You have to turn up this time on a Wednesday. But it is abs all in part of their labour law and their collective bargaining agreement. And that's absolutely where we want to get to, just to have more protections in place for the players. Do you think that the players are fairly rewarded for the risks they're taking today? <laughs> Good question. Um, no, I don't, actually. I think, I think they're rewarded according to the affordability of the sport. But I think if you look at the recent Sky deal in football, for example, um, you look at the leading cricketers in England, um, I think our players are rewarded not as well by comparison. I think a lot of that has to do with media values. Clearly, we've got almost like a sort of open golf-style tender coming up for the Six Nations. Um, there is a lot more interest in rugby. This will be the most successful Rugby World Cup ever in terms of uh, profits. It will be making well over £150 million profit. Um, so given the sort of shortened career span of the players and the fact, as I bore everyone to death with when I see them, the fans and the, and the TV cameras aren't there to turn up and watch the committee boxes. They're there to watch the players. So do they get well rewarded? I think there's considerable scope for growth. Damien, thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you.